you see the Pope? Do you see the Pope Francis like some like e girls photo? Did you see this? No, I did not. One of the funniest fucking things I've ever seen. In my life. <laughs> I'm just turning off my phone. Making. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, you know what? Honestly, it's it's been one of those days where everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Oh shit! Tell me what happened. Yeah. So now just bullshit with my computer. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, I had to go run out and get get a new router. Oh no! Fuck. Yeah, yeah, but that's stressful. Silver lining is that I now have like the best Wi-Fi I've ever had. <laughs> that's so. Crazy. So I'll take that. But I had so many problems over the past couple of days that I was just I was going crazy. I was on the phone with Verizon for days and trying to figure all fuck. this out, and I was just like, screw it. I can't. I do this. You know what I mean? Like this is what I yeah. do. And my wife works from home too. Yep. So she uh she's in education so she does she's on zoom all day long and uh we're both like sucking up the wi-fi here like crazy so finally got to figure it out but love it <sighs> anyway <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me on man I, I really appreciate it thank you for coming on and it's uh a pleasure to meet you man honestly i mean i know it's a virtual meeting but yeah this awesome. is uh this is really cool so uh, um john vanderslice welcome to the hell fucking yeah podcast Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how are you? <laughs> How's it going? I'm How's good. life? Honestly, I'm good. I mean, the the first, what are we, we're in the eight months of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I would say the first, maybe the first five months were like absolute psychological terror, uh, breakdown, like, like, like profound mental illness and like suicidal yeah. ideation and yeah. then and like something like some forest burned down up here do you know what i mean it was like some fucking thing happened where it just incinerated all of the old neural pathways mm -hmm. and i started meditating and i started um i don't know i started being like i started going to therapy and i started being like very very vigilant about my mental health because yeah. i did not want to keep cascading down the fucking chute, you know? Absolutely. And so I feel incredibly happy right now. And I feel, yeah. totally, I feel like, honestly, I could just like stay in this pandemic. It's fine. I'm okay. I'm totally fine. You know what? I relate a hundred percent really. When this first, when this whole thing first happened in March, um, I, I actually was a uh, barber. I had my own shop and oh, shit. I, it was just me working there. So obviously I had to close down. Um, and then I went back for a little while and it just wasn't panning out, you know? It's just people weren't coming out to get haircuts. It's just yeah. people were buzzing their own head at home, whatever they were doing. And uh, so I wound up shutting down permanently. Um, but within that time period between March and July, I started doing this. And this was something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, here we are, you know? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, right? It's, it's amazing. Like, it, once again, a silver lining, you know? Um, I wouldn't have been able to do this without it. You yeah. know, and the fact that my wife works from home and makes makes the money, <laughs> yeah, uh, gives me this opportunity to do it. So I'm lucky in that way. But yeah. without without this whole shutdown thing, um, I was just saying this the other day with somebody on on the show. Actually, I was like, this. I hate to say this, but this is the best thing that's happened to me. <laughs> I I totally get it. And you know, it leads you to think that if anything ends, if anything ends, that it's actually inherently good, which is fucking crazy to think about. Yeah. you know what I mean. It's like yeah, absolutely. If, if you can survive it and it's not someone that you love getting sick, mm -hmm. you know, or dying, anything else, anything having to do with like your career, your personal life, your finances, like whatever, if you get through it, you're going to be better off. And that's Absolutely. Kind of crazy because it makes you wish desire destruction in your life a little bit. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and know, of course, uh, go, ahead. No, go ahead. What were you going to say, Mike? I was going to say, of course, you know, I, um, I wish everyone the best. I hope no one does get sick or, or of course, dies or anything like yeah. that. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, all right, so I got something good out of this, you know? Yeah, we, and we got to take the best. Hold on, I'm going to raise my blinds because I want there to be more yeah. light on me. More Absolutely. Stuff. Hold on, yep. I think it'll look better. You got it. I'm going to bring up the lights a little bit. <clears throat> okay. This look, yeah, this is better, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah it looks great. It looks great. Um, Love it. I like your hair. Yeah, it's done, it's done up. I gotta make it a little messier because I put some junk in it. <laughs> yeah, so I my did. Friend Leticia oh. does that. Yeah, you have nice blue in there. Yeah, I don't know if yeah, I was wondering if you could see it or not. It's, it's uh, like teal, right? 
Yeah, it's weird. I did it. Um, so I have black hair naturally, and yeah. I uh, I did it like last week, and I bleached the top like white, and then I put the blue in. Uh, yeah. It's like manic panic voodoo blue or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I have that and, too. Yeah, and it's you know it washes out. So it, it was much more blue the first day, but it's yeah. you know I wash my I take a shower every day, so it's like because I'm a freak you, like that. But you know what I I do too. But you know what I've done? <laughs> I've stopped washing my hair just strictly because of I don't want to lose the color. I know, I know. So maybe try not to wash it because I can I can get away with it for like three weeks. Yeah, I did it. it. I did it. Um, the first I bought this like color preserve shampoo yeah yeah and it seems to be working i just started using it for like a couple days that's great um and i did stop washing for a couple days but my hair gets like i'm italian so my hair gets so greasy if i don't wash it in a couple days um but i've been using conditioner and things like that i don't know it's i never had blue so uh, it's something new i'm going to try and And blue fades the best of all the colors i think it looks better at the end than anything else yeah yeah it's it it's like a chameleon though it's changing colors every day and but i kind of dig it i like it yep so uh, where are you living now? I live in Los Angeles, and I moved here a year ago. I live in um, historic Filipino town. I'm very happy here. I was like, I mean, I would had only really been here maybe six months before the pandemic, so I was kind of on a roll. Like, I was super stoked at my life here and, like, how things were going. But, you know, it's I I'm, I'm, can't wait just for all of the – the stuff that I was kind of learning about, you know, all the restaurants, the bars, the the kind of like social scene here. There's like really good part house parties in LA. Sure. And like, I don't know. I'm I'm I I'm really happy here. Very cool. Um, <laughs> what's the deal right now with the pandemic? Is are you shut down right now or yeah, quarantine? It, yeah, it's pretty like it's wild because LA did have like a pretty intense moment. I think around like May it was the numbers here were, I think they were the worst in the country. Yeah. And there's a lot of multi-generational families here in living in like, you know, single dwellings. That's like, that's often like a, 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 you know, a super spreader kind of like potential. Um, There are like definitely the city is chaotic. So it kind of can, can maybe, make people a little bit more lax about rules and stuff. Like Mm. for instance, I don't really hesitate to drive drunk in LA because there's (laughs) literally no chance that you will fucking be pulled over. Like if you're white, you know what I mean? Like, unfortunately, if you're a fucking white dude who drives a Subaru, (laughs) you could probably be like rolling a pookie while you're driving and be fine. You know what I mean? So like, But like the, so I think that LA, um, cause the Bay area was like model, the, you know, San Francisco was like the model city. And I think that part of that is just that it's a cramped small place. Um, there's like a high percentage of Asian Americans. So you have like a mask culture that's there all the time. I mean, people wear masks in San Francisco all the time. Sure. So it's like, it's an, it was a, I think it was an easy sell to the city, but LA now the numbers are, I don't, it's not purple or red. I think it's like yellow on the map, on the hazard map. So it's, it's definitely not going to get singed like the, the, the interior of the country. Where, where are you, by the way, right now? I am on Long Island, New York. Oh, fuck yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's man. great. How, where are you I, on Long Island? I'm in a garage. <laughs> no, I mean, how no, I know. I know. <laughs> um, I am, I'm actually not too far from. The uh, very famous lake, Lake Ronkonkoma. Whoa, that's awesome, man. It's famous for a, um, I don't know the whole story, but an Indian princess takes a, takes a life every year in the lake. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, has it happened every year? No, but, but there was a series of years where it did happen, like I would say early 2000s, like, Damn. like 10 years straight. Uh, someone would go out into the lake and it was always a white male. Wow. And the story, I don't really, like I said, I don't really know the story, but because there's so many different variations, but it's some kind of revenge. Yeah, that sounds, uh, well, then they need to take a lot like more than one a year if, if there's going to be yeah. revenge <laughs> yeah. fucking yeah. white people did to Native Americans. Man. Yeah, they're actually, they're building a, um, they're sculpting a, like a tree stump Indian princess, like right in front of the lake right now. It's kind of cool. That's uh, cool. They've done stories on it. There's, there's supposedly going to be a movie about it. Wow. So yeah, I'm in Lake Grove. I'm like five minutes away from there. That's awesome. I fucking love that area, man. Like, that's great. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I love New York. You know, it's uh, 
I'm about an hour and a half from Manhattan, so I don't have that. That's perfect, though, yeah, man. This is the you suburbs, can, but, you know. You can access it. My, I'm going to live in New York. Within five years, I'm going to be living in New York. Here yeah, New yeah. Here it's a, have, you ever, have you ever lived here before? No, or no? never. No. I, I was born for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good place. I mean, it's expensive <laughs> as fuck, but it, it's, it's a good place. You get what you pay for, man. <laughs> so, That's it. That's it. Um, so yeah, I'm in a garage because my house is very small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and my wife works from home, so we wouldn't be able to do these things together at the same no. time. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, we can, we can only afford, you, you, like you just said, you get what you pay for. You can only afford like this little shed that we live in. <laughs> uh, it's very expensive over here, but it's very nice. So there's always a trade off, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but let's get into the music. Cool. So that's cool with you. Absolutely. Uh, so for those who may not know, John is a um, multi-instrument musician, singer, songwriter, producer, and engineer. Um, so man, you've been doing this for a very long time. Yep. Uh, how long? I'm 53. I started writing songs when I was 14. So wow. that's a long time. <laughs> that's a long and time. And what's funny is that like I, like, I don't, I think about this a lot. Like, I don't think that you ever really get better at what you do. Like, like I think that like you, you, you don't get better, but you might get, you might get more fearless if you get lucky. Like that's the only thing that could happen. Do you know what I mean? Right, like right. you might get more scared people as people get older. A lot of them, I mean, look at like Trumpers and stuff. Like people get fucking scared. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They start like getting worried about like <clears throat> really weird, bizarre shit. And it happens to, <laughs> to like musicians where they become just like naturally more conservative as they're as the, the the kind of media that they're taking in starts getting constricted the music that they're being challenged by gets gets a little duller then they just and i know this just from producing records and from watching artists work that in general their most radical work is accidental and it's at the beginning of their career that's right. you know and that's why we skew you know like you 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 listen your band your favorite bands and it's often like whoa second third fourth record is like the sweet spot and then like sometimes nothing ever happens again you know what i right. mean like so i've been fighting that my whole life and terrified of kind of repeating myself and terrified of getting into too many systems of uh you know of like of, of songwriting and production and like and song song making so i'm doing my best now i'm like almost entirely electronic now and yeah like, so I'm, I'm just, and I, I try to challenge myself by working with other producers. And now I've been working with these two guys, Rob Shelton and Jamie Riotto. And they're like, they're from another fucking planet, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like they're on a different <laughs> trip and they're total geniuses. And they've completely really saved, saved me in many ways, like creatively. Yeah. I think that that's like the value of a producer. It's like, it's not to make you like buttoned up. It's to like smash your, you know, your, your kind of like con concretized like cheat codes and your systems you know sure so would you say that like you have more confidence now and that's why as far as like being you know 18 years old i would i would say that it, like it i wouldn't i would say maybe that it's confidence but i would say that it's more of like so there's like this you know it's the problem of the ego right it's like you can't you you see yourself in like a hall of mirrors, right? So it's like, it's being like ping ponged and fragmented back to, to you from so many different angles. And it's like, it, it's so warped and it's so um, exhausting that what, what's really interesting is that when you first start writing music, so when I first started writing music, my mom bought me a four track and I think I was 15. So I was just starting writing songs. And those first, kind of like three years of making music on a four track were really like, they're like my benchmark because I'm sure all of that music is total garbage, but I was really truly making music for myself. And it was yeah. like, it was much more like a child, like, like, like having, you know, we, you see kids with like, like Tonka trucks or whatever, and they have some elaborate, and there's an angle that you could look at that and just say, that is like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like this kid thinks that this like dump truck on a carpet is actually like hauling dirt. And then if you really think about it, you're like, whoa, like that is pure pleasure and pure joy. Sure. And, and 
things can only get contaminated by routing them through someone else's experience, right? So the problem is with bands, and this is the reason why most artists that we know have simply gone insane and also maybe don't make the most exciting work is that their creative process starts getting filtered out and running through these other neural networks, right? So it's like some matrix shit or something, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And so you get a, 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 an indie rock band, this results in an indie rock band putting out records every four years because they're literally pro toolsing and editing this record to death for like a solid fucking year. Right. And it's so exhausting and it's so expensive and it's so fucking <laughs> uninspired mm -hmm. that like the band just eventually just like kind of runs out of like fuel, you know, you need fucking right. jet fuel, you know? And so my whole life has been trying to get back to that place of automatic creation and, and of like inspired um, kind of like very idios idiosyncratic and true to myself. And man, it's hard. It's so yep. hard. Listen, drugs play a part in this for people. You have to learn how to do it without drugs or you will just simply be a drug addict and you can't yeah. have that. And like, so that's been my, that's been my thing. So, confidence isn't necessarily because i think that like we're all a blend of we're all an unknowable blend of the most fragile motherfuckers on the planet and like i truly don't care do you know what i mean so like i kind of am pinging between these things and it's it's like not i mean i've seen people that journey be painful for people it's not painful for me but it just depends on your brain chemistry in the day but i'm mostly re i would say reasonably confident <laughs> but that's about it that's the max <laughs> Yeah, no, I got it. I got, I totally understand what you're saying. So that kind of brings me to my next thing. Your, your first band was MK Ultra. Yeah. Right. Um, you formed in the nineties. Uh, you released three albums, if that's right. Yeah, three, three albums. Yeah. Three albums. Um, and the, but they were all kind of like three, maybe four years apart. Yeah. Yeah. They were. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. so then you released your first album, uh, mass suicide called figurines, um, in 2000. Yeah. So, what happened to MK Ultra, and was it the initial intent to make your own record? Well, it's funny because you 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 mentioned like your 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 shop, you know, and like 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 my entire identity was MK Ultra, and we were a band that could, if we were playing a Saturday night, we would maybe have three people in the audience. You know what I mean? Like we right. we we hit ourselves against a wall, <laughs> our heads against a wall for like for five, six, seven years. And like, it was like, we might've been in an, in an insane asylum. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. like, and it, no, nobody's fault. Like there's, there's a lot better bands than MK Ultra. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I have never been deluded about what I'm doing. And like, so I remember my bandmates who were incredible people. They were starting to get like other offers from bands. And at the time in San Francisco, bands were getting signed. So a band got signed to DreamWorks and they asked my bass player to join, et cetera, like, you know, put him on retainer. And so in 1999, we had made three records. We had gone nowhere. We had, we had probably profited minus, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, you know, if you like take in, into account like opportunity costs and like, and so they, they were like, Hey, let's have a band meeting. And I just thought they were like going to be like, Oh, I think they're, <laughs> I think we should like submit to this show or whatever, you know, like I thought it was just like, I was so delusional and they sat me down and they're like, we want to end the band. And I just broke into tears. Like, like I was like being broken up with and it, it really was like shattered me. You know what I mean? And like, it's, uh, and they are so sweet to me. And the funny thing is, is that I look back and it's just like, man, it was of course, of course the best thing that happened. Like anything that breaks, anything that is torched, if it's like an art project or something, it doesn't like, it's always better for you. Right. So, right. so the, I let, so they basically broke up the band. I was really sad. And then I was kind of like in some ways forced to like pick up the pieces. And I didn't have, I was a waiter. I mean, I was a waiter from, I worked in food service from when I was 16, excuse me, until when I was 33. So I was like a, I started out as a busser and then I was a line cook at this deli in, in, um, in Maryland. And then I just, it just kept going. I was like a, like a catering waiter at like a frozen crab restaurant in San Francisco. And so I 
the only thing I knew how to do was like be have this flexible job that was like embarrassing to hold when you're 33 and you're serving like soft serve ice cream on the tray. You know what I mean? Sure. And to try to make records. But once I went solo and I had that reset button, then I was able to like kind of like get better and level up. And I started making music that was just weirder because it was just me and I didn't really know what I was doing. And it was more true to me. And MP Ultra, I'm proud of those records. I I wouldn't recommend that anyone listen to them, but (laughs) I'm like proud of them. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and you know, like when you started putting out records in 2000, it seemed to be, at least for a couple of years, like every year you were putting something out. Yeah, I was, a- I was, I was hustling. And, and the, the reason why, like, I was so slow in MK Ultra days is that we were starting to build the studio while, like, so all of those three MK Ultra records were recorded at Tiny Telephone, but it was, two of them were recorded before Tiny Telephone was a commercial room. So mm-hmm. it was like, we were building and wiring and then recording and then putting up drywall and recording. So it was like, right. Agonizing. And we were so deluded. We thought like, oh, building a studio will take us six months. And it, you know, it was like, four years you know so yeah and so once the studio was up and running and then like then I had the kind of like the the fluidity to kind of just like stay put and make shit and and be fast about it and like and I and to me that it's really important that that people make records that are a little bit faster than what they're comfortable with because you don't want to edit and second guess yourself Mm -hmm. so you want to be on the edge of what's possible for you schedule wise Right, right. You sit on something for a long time and you wind up changing it a million times. It's, it's, it's death. To the point where it becomes what you were saying before, just worked to death. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and we're going to get to Tiny Telephone a little bit. Um, but back to the first album, the song Bill Gates Must Die. Yes. That gained some media attention. Um, yes. Now, did Microsoft threaten legal action or was that a hoax? It was a total hoax. It was, a, <laughs> it was a letter that my, it was my brother's idea. And like, it was funny because he just, he had like really good ideas. Like it was my brother's idea. And he, he just like, like he, I don't know, he spitballed it in like three minutes. And then yeah. so I just wrote, I wrote a, a, a fake letter. It was so clearly like for like a news out, you know, like I, I sent it to like the SF Chronicle and they ran. Right. Like you'd think that the Chronicle which is dealing with tech companies and has like fact checkers and stuff, especially in 2000. Right. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I got on the front page of this, of the, the Sunday style section, wow. you know what I mean? Like, like they ran with this shit. And then they, of course, after two months, I did an interview with Wired. Like it was like, it was unbelievable how much mainstream press it got. And it was my first taste of like having anyone pay attention to what I was doing. First off, my first, it's amazing because I probably, the first morning that the, fir- the first big article hit, I probably had like 200 emails in my inbox and it actually made me feel physically sick. I was just like, you think you want something and then when you get it, you're like, <laughs> fuck no. And yeah. part of it is that some of it is just like, like, whoa, okay, this is a cool song. But then the other part of it, there's, there's a couple things in my head. One was like, shit. I don't want to do fucking hoaxes. Like I want to make good records. I don't want to have to pull some fucking prank to get people to pay attention. But of course I was a nobody. So I had to do something. Yeah. And then the second thing was that the attention is any attention is toxic because there's going to be one, two, three percent of people in there that are just simply mentally ill. <laughs> and like, so you would get like, I mean, you'd get like crazy shit sent to you and like emailed to you. And I got, 0.01% of what, I don't know, Logan Paul gets or, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I can't right. even imagine being really famous. It's like, it's a, it must be a mind fuck. So it was like really intense for me. But that's funny though, because I mean, we're talking the year 2000. Um, you, it wasn't, you couldn't get famous with Instagram or Facebook yep. or YouTube yeah. or anything like that. So you had to be crafty and hey, that's a cool way to do it. And I didn't have a label, so. Right. Now with the, um, the CD artwork was uh, Windows installation drive, um, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, uh, disc. Um, yeah. Was there? Was it released like that, or was it? Le- it was. It wasn't because because we would have been sued. But we we <laughs> did put out. I think we released five hundred mm. of those versions. Nice. With, with Windows, and I still have one of them, and it's like yeah. I'm so proud of that shit. 
That's awesome. So proud. So in 2012, you left your record contract and created a Kickstarter campaign. Yes. uh, To start your own label. Yeah. Uh, This was not only successful, but it's currently one of the Kickstarters, Kickstarters, top most funded projects in music. I can't talk today. Uh, Was what was it like in that moment having gained that support? That was fucking crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was it was so crazy on so many levels because, I mean, the thing is, if I think about like the peaks and valleys of my life, like it's like I've definitely like had thought of a lot of depression. I mean, I started getting depressed when I was six, so it's like I I just started having like a lot of like kind of like lost months in, in my life, you know, and like 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 just like profound uh, feelings of like not wanting to exist. So, so like, and I'm just setting up that there's also, and I don't feel that I'm like manic at all. I don't have manic patterns. I just have like sadness. But when, when I get out of those cycles and I do work, I've always worked really hard and I've always wanted to like make things. I've always wanted to have a conversation with an audience however limited that audience was that that didn't matter to me and I've always wanted to build things like a a recording studio and and like be a productive like worker you know like I'm I'm always in it for the right reasons but the the peaks of my life if I think about it sometimes they're like it's really phenomenal because so I was on dead oceans at the time and I love dead oceans I love that whole secretly Canadian family but there was something that just wasn't clicking for me for whatever reason. Like I wasn't clicking on dead oceans. Like it was the wrong time for me. I was, I think I was in kind of maybe the wrong period of my career at that point. Mm-hmm. I think I wanted to work. It's funny because I wanted to work faster and I wanted to be, make more irrational decisions, but you know, everything changed. I'll tell you why in a little bit, but so I asked them to, to be released from the contract. They were awesome. They let me off. And then they also, extended out to like um to to uh distribute the next record so that was huge for me so secretly canadian was distributing it and i'm still on secretly canadian publishing so i still have this like very important and also i just finished a record like two days ago and i'm yeah. gonna i'm gonna send it to them because i actually i think i want to be back on the label <laughs> i mean they'll probably say no but i don't i don't care i I'm, i don't have a problem asking for what i want so yeah. so i got off the label. And then I decided to do the Kickstarter and parallel with this, I had met someone just randomly when I was on tour in Pittsburgh, they were like working in a cafe and I have no idea why, but for the first and only time in my life, I wrote a note to someone that had spoke to me, maybe two sentences. And it was, and the note was just like, Hey, I'm kind of like absolutely shocked that I'm doing this. You probably have a boyfriend. I'm, I just want like you to know that for some reason I want us to email. Just if you want to send me an email, if you're comfortable with that, here's my email. I don't want to meet with you. I'm leaving town. This isn't like a hookup thing. Right. I just want you to eat, to email me. So I, I left the cafe and I, I like put it in my backpack a couple of times. I'm like, there's no fucking way you can give someone a note. Like this is psycho shit. And so I eventually gave it to her. She did not want the note at all, but she was kind of forced to take it because when someone's handing something to you, you, you have to take it. She took it. And then maybe a week later, she wrote me an email and it started this kind of like intense and amazing and like really, really, really intense like love. I mean, like, wow. like one of the most, the peak experiences of my life. So we fell in love. We eventually ended up meeting like after maybe, maybe it was like another couple weeks we met and then we met again, we met again. Then we, 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 you know, we were in love. So the first time she was like teaching at Harvard. So the first time that I visited her in Boston, I flew in and the Kickstarter started the next day. So I remember being in a room and we were on my computer. I was so in love with her. Like, like, wow. you know, like I still am. I like adore her name's Dana Locke. I've written like a bunch of songs about her okay. and, and a song on, on, on Dagger Beach about her. And I remember, so we would, you know, you launch it, you set it to launch on a date. So then you're just waiting. Right. So it's right. like, 
I think they say like Thursday at 4 p.m. or something. It's like this like prime time and then it ends on, you know, Friday, right? I don't know how. To. So we launched it. We were just sitting there drinking coffee and I just watched those fucking numbers roll. And yeah. again, I, I remember thinking like, okay, this is peak fucking JV. Like you will never <laughs> ever like crazy in love with someone who's just so fun and like adorable and amazing and super smart and like everything I ever wanted in a human being. And then watching this, this, this feeling of like, whoa, I can actually exist as an artist now for the first time in my life. I have support from like people that want um, to engage with like what I'm making. Absolutely. And it was amazing. So that's that when I think about that Kickstarter, that I think about that look at being in, in Boston, looking out through her windows and like, and watching those numbers. Roll. That's a beautiful story. And that's amazing to have something so monumental happen from just a little note. I, I mean, I that's think amazing. about her like, I don't know, every couple of days. Wow. So then after this happened, you released uh, Dagger Beach, which you yeah. just mentioned. Um, and, Di and Diamond Dogs uh, cover album of David Bowie's full album. Yeah. Um, oh my God, man. I love that rendition of Diamond Dogs. That's awesome. That is amazing. I love all your music. Um, I've been listening to it nonstop over the past couple of weeks. Um, so the Diamond Dogs rendition, is it's just not a straight cover album. It's, um, you really made it your own. The, some of the lyrics were changed, different song structures, chord progressions all while maintaining the aesthetic of the original. What's the story, what's the story behind the idea of this album? Okay, so with, with I, I wanted to do, so part of like why I wanted to leave Dead Oceans is that I wanted to do stuff that was like, like kind of like faster and weirder and then didn't really, labels are amazing, but they have to defend their, I'm so small that I have a record cycle and they have to defend that because they have to get everything that they can get out of that record cycle. Uh, because I just, I, I'm, I don't generate like, like a lot of profit. So <laughs> like, I get that, like, it's totally makes sense. But so on my, when I was on my own, I was just like, okay, I'm going to do a, you know, it was like a way to run up the numbers on the Kickstarter. I was like, okay, what can I offer? Like maybe I'll cover one song from Diamond Dogs. Diamond Dogs to me was always the most, problematic and most Bowie album that he ever made. It's the mm -hmm. peak um, cocaine. Mm -hmm. And it's like the only album that he played all the guitar on. And it, in many ways, it's, the, it's really the one where you feel Bowie's hand as a producer more than anyone else. Like it feels very true to his own like ideals, his style. It's incredibly fragmented. He is clearly piecing together some bizarre shit, some like, some like cut and paste Burroughs stuff with like, with like this failed Orwell, like musical or whatever concept record that he was going to do before like the Orwell estate, you know, put the kibosh on that. And like, so he's trying to piece together this record that is kind of like, it's definitely feels in some way, like it's the, it's the most rushed and maybe the least kind of like polished of all the seventies records. And in many ways it's, like one of my favorite records of all time because yeah. of that, because you, you feel like the edges of like, of what he's possible capable of doing. And the, the highlights of that record are fucking stunning. So at first I was going to do a song and then I was just like, fuck it. Let's just like do a level on this Kickstarter thing where it's like, if I get to this level, then I think it was like 50 grand or 70 grand or something. Then I'll like do this full cover of Diamond Dog. So when that happened, I enlisted, people that I just started playing music with, including Rob Shelton and Jamie Riotto, who I had, who now produce all my records. Mm -hmm. And then my longtime drummer, Jason Floda, who's a genius. The amazing thing is that they had no, no interest in listening to David Bowie's Diamond Dogs. They, they don't dislike David Bowie. They just were just like, hey, I like sent them the songs and the, and the tabs. They're like, nah, let's not do that. We don't care. And they're, they're like, yeah, I think we've heard Rebel Rebel on the radio once, but they don't care. And they, you know, right. they listen to fucking Mingus and like, do you know what I mean? Like Coltrane, like they just don't, they don't really care. And so I love that because I was just like, okay, I'll teach you the song. So it'll be like really weird. It'll be like a game of telephone. Like I'll teach you the songs and then you'll figure out some other shit, but you won't be quoting the music. So that's why it sounds so fucking different. It doesn't nod to Bowie. I mean, you have like a Bowie obsessive, 
in the, at the front of it, like singing, but all the music is like geniuses just fucking around. And so <laughs> I, I think that, that that's why it works for me. Right. Absolutely. And it, it definitely shows. It's, it's very, very cool. I really, really dig that album. Um, I really like the, uh, the, new, the newest album you have out. Oh, uh, yeah. E, the EP. The, well, no, the EP, yes, but uh, Dollar Hits. Oh, yeah, I like Dollar Hits. That's really, that's Jamie and Rob to the hill. That's yeah. like Jamie and Rob. That's so cool. Um, I like how it's just kind of electronic for the first, you know, 20 minutes or so, and then yeah. vocals kick in. Yep. Uh, it makes more of an experience. It's almost like yes. one song in a way. You know what yes. I mean? Yes, 100%. So, that's so cool. I love that. Um, uh, you're also known for using analog instruments. And yeah. it's clear to me that, you know, after listening to your work, uh, that you certainly are an advocate for manipulating sounds and experimentation. So what would you say is your greatest inspiration for your prolific style? I would say right now it's so something kind of like switched with me where so I've like I had been like maybe ambivalent or kind of on the edge of like caring about electronic music and then I took I think maybe two years ago I was on the dark web and I was like oh I'm gonna buy some like crystal MDMA because my a couple of my friends <laughs> So we took some MDMA and we, we, I think one of them had made a playlist and it had like, and you know, the usual shit. It had like Autechre and Apex Twin and stuff. And I was on Molly and I was like rolling really hard because this, it was like really, really good stuff. And I, it just, something changed in my brain chemistry like forever. Like yeah. I was like, this is all that matters. This is it. Yeah. This is the only thing I care about. And it, oddly kind of like dovetailed nicely i've i've been like interested in rap for a long time maybe mm -hmm. since i was like 17 like criminal minded like early you know early like harris one public enemy that stuff and like i was a typical fucking white suburban kid who's like whoa this feels like actual punk music to me <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah and so it kind of when i when i had the thing with mdma it kind of like fit into this long time like love affair with like rap production that I was like, whoa, okay. Like there's a way, there's a way in here. Like somehow I can find a way to like sing over electronic music. Like I can just kind of like, just figure this out. I can like, like I can listen to and, and, and like kind of like borrow and steal from black noise and like, like, I don't know, like Timber, Timberland and like, and, uh, and, and Bon Iver and like, oh, and Kanye and all of these like things that were kind of like, like overlapping genres and that were kind mm -hmm. of like very forward thinking, you know, like, like, like icons to me. And so I just started obsessing and obsessing and I got, um, really, really into this Berlin duo called Mode Selector. And so, I mean, it was like my most listened to artist in 2018 and 2019. So, so like basically dollar hits, like what you're hearing now is me entering into this world, like, like a fucking cult believer. Like I'm in yeah. the cult, I'll do anything for fucking Koresh. You know what I mean? Like, right. like just point and I'll do it. Is Mode Selector more electronic or hip hop? Or? Yeah, yeah, Mode Selector is, and it's interesting because they've done really inter interesting collaborations with like Bus Driver and uh, some just fantastic like rap people, but they're, and they've, I found out about them because they did a couple songs with Tom York. So they, they do a oh, wow. lot of collaborations with singers. So there was something that I really liked about somehow figuring out how to, um, how to cross these genres, you know? And like Mode Selector, they was like, it's so well executed and it's so, it sounds so good. And, and they're like trying, it sounds like they're trying to solve a math equation, you know, but yeah. they're also incredibly like empathetic and, and like, they're just pop people at heart. You know what I mean? Like there's right. like song structure somewhere in there and the Aphex Twin does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, Aphex Twin is amazing. Um... I come to Daddy EP is like one of my favorites it's, it's, of it's all time. So beautiful. good. I mean, that it shit. really is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> From what I understand, he just 
he makes some of those records in like a day. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> he's like, he's oddly, it's funny because he's like, kind of like oddly very productive and then you don't hear a word from him. Right. Like, Right. And I think Cyro is one of the best things he's ever made. And that, that was also inspiring to me because it's like, he disappeared. It felt like he wasn't like even really interested in, in, in like being a, you know, like a public person. And right. then he put out a record that was like, perfect. Right. <laughs> yeah, go figure. Um, so every album of yours has an individual feel and theme to it. Uh, would you say your records are cathartic for those moments in time? of what's happening around you, either personally or empathetically? I would I yes. I, I mean, I, I try to, I mean, you know, on some level, like probably every record is in some ways, it's like a kind of a hope, hopeful, like almost like a, like it's like an offering to like, to like the de the depression gods, like leave me alone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like records. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I make these things to to like to find happiness, you know, and mm -hmm. to and to be um, like my mind is not like r restful, which which I like. But but if I'm productive and I'm making things, then I don't turn on myself. So all of these things are offerings out to like. To, to like for some kind of like gentleness to not like basically cannibalize myself, you know? Like sure. But I would say that like, that yes. And, and, and I would, I try to, as much as possible, I try to um, be present lyrically and honest in, in every way that I can so that they are connected in time and that they're not performative. I mean, listen, one thing that happens with songwriters is that they, they learn systems. And they are, they're just simply like behaviors. It's like, you go home for Thanksgiving, you visit your parents and you, f you might as well be 12 years old again. You fall into these like regressive habits, right? Sure. So we have these like, these neural loops, right? So I, I think that like the difficulty is, is that you learn, you learn a craft, you learn how to do something, but then you have to like keep smashing it or you will just, it will become performative. You know, you simply won't even be able to connect to any real emotion because you're like, okay, pre-chorus. Oh, I know to modulate here, we're going to modulate, you know, de a, a mi to a minor third and, and then it's going to be 16 bars or, you know, you know, all these fucking things. Yeah. So then it was like, to me, it was just like, okay, if I'm listening to mode selector and I just like literally am just counting down the days until I can take MDMA again. Right. <laughs> you can only do it every three months. Like, like maybe that I should be like, maybe I should be like, um, like truly honoring that because that's all I care about. So that's why you are listening to dollar hits and you're like, Whoa, it's been like 20 minutes and <laughs> we're on a fucking drug jam here, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. I love that. Man. Uh, is that true? You can't take every, every three months. You have to, you have to wait. To take yeah, Anna, Anna and Alexander Shulgin, who kind of like co-invented maybe MDMA, they mm. really recommended that you never take it more than every three months. Well, and Anna Shulgin warned that like, basically you, if you don't do that, that you can kind of like fuck up your brain chemistry because you're not, you know, your serotonin is, you know, you're just like, you're, 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 you're draining the well, you know? So, the idea is that she warned that like you could basically maybe never really have the same experience again if you do it like too fast. So I think that, um, that that is like, I think that's pretty, it's, I think that my, my motto has always been like, do less drugs so you can do more drugs, you know, like do less drugs so you can never have a problem with drugs. Right. You know, my, my parents were alcoholics. So I, I, I saw the, the kind of end game of like, like abusing a drug. And I just, I, first off, I don't want to, to do that. It's disrespectful. And that one, and then two, it's better to have like a broader rotation of drugs and not rely on one single drug. And three, you need to, to like, you need to be, you need to have systems in place that guarantee that you're healthy. My system is that I run five days a week. If you run five days a week, if I have more than two drinks, 
right? And if I wake up and go running and it's 95 degrees, I will literally fucking fall down on the dirt path. So it keeps you honest. You know what I mean? Like there's so yeah. many times when I'm out and I let, you know, I'm like a, I'm a, you know, thoughtful, I, I like cocaine. I like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, microdosing LSD. I like MDMA. I like weed. I like alcohol. I like opium, but you have to have these things on a schedule. Right. <laughs> you're going to fucking die. Like there's no right. way, you know? And like, but the funniest thing is that the worst thing for me, as far as like keeping myself in check, the worst thing I can ever do is put alcohol in my body. Like that's how yeah. this country chose the most fucked up toxic. Oh my God. Yeah. To make it the fuck, you know, to make it fucking like, a, like it, that's America's drug. I say and that all the time. I say that all the time. It is the worst, you know, I mean, besides like heroin, it is the, the worst thing you can put in your body. <laughs> it's the worst thing. It's the worst uh, in in a you know and they they throw it out to you in big bottles and six packs i mean it's yeah. it's insane um i had a problem with cocaine for a little while uh yeah. like a problem <laughs> do you understand how great it is <laughs> yeah i do i do um like what was what was your peak performance on on coke like what were you what were you doing let's let's just say what was the most you ever remember doing in one day right right oh man forget it i would just i would be all over the place i would see you know all my friends my family i'd be sneaking in, in and out of the bathroom every five seconds uh <laughs> yard work would be done housework would be done. <laughs> um <laughs> i just got it all done you know uh, and then there were some times where it wasn't as good and it would actually be the complete opposite i would be like oh. standing in the corner <laughs> so it, it just how did, you, how did you get out of it what did you do uh, I literally was like, holy shit. I spent a lot of money. Um, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I'm an asshole. I'm not sure. I think I'm becoming an asshole. Yeah. And I literally just was like, you know what? I have to, I have to stop completely. And I did stop. And then like, I did it like maybe once I started doing it like in moderation. Yeah. Like maybe I would do like one, once every couple of weeks. Yeah. And I was like, ah, this just isn't the same. Yeah. To the point where I actually got kind of boring. I was like, all right, yeah. I guess I'm done with it. I guess this phase of my life, I can move on from it now. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, if, if it were to happen and pop up right now, would I do it? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think I'd ever go back to that. Like, oh my God, um, I have to go take a drive to the 7-Eleven. Let me do a line of cocaine. <laughs> Every, everything I did involved it. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good for you man listen we gotta get my this mom, stuff. Yeah, my mom. <laughs> we gotta get this stuff out of our system you know what i yeah. mean like, yeah you're gonna do drugs like listen people are like they spend their lifetime on fucking ssris or whatever like you're gonna do drugs just like right. be, be like honest and thoughtful and and again maybe do less drugs so you can do more drugs yeah know? yeah and i mean there you know i lost weight from doing it and i've gained weight yeah. back but listen <laughs> Yeah, I can work on that. You know, it's uh, yeah. alcohol never really did anything for me. So I never really had the problem with that. Um, yeah. It always just kind of made me like sick. Yeah. So I never really had a problem But that that cocaine, man. That is some. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good one. That is I'm some good time. It's a good one. <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk about tiny telephone. Yeah. Uh, you're the owner and founder of this recording studio in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, besides yourself, some others who have recorded there, Death Cab for Cutie, Sleater Kinney, The Mountain Goats, Spoon, just to name a few. Um, but after researching it, please tell me this hasn't closed. <laughs> Actually, it, the, there's, so there were two studios. There was one in San Francisco that okay. had two rooms, okay. and then there was one in Oakland. And the one in San Francisco closed earlier this year. Okay. I mean, we, you know, that we held on for 22 years in San Francisco. Yeah. It's fucking magic. It's amazing. Like we, I mean, if we planned to close down before COVID, but if, if we hadn't have, we would have closed down. We would have gotten like absolutely kicked out. So, you know, we, it's funny because we planned to close. Like we started it like a year before COVID. We had this whole closing plan. Our landlord was amazing. He like, he let us off like, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars worth of rent because we were we were really we could not keep up with rent. We had seven thousand square feet in the Mission District in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive places to rent space, and we couldn't keep up with like 
competing with like tech incubators and like startups. So we just slowly got priced out. Our landlord made it very easy on us. And we had this like amazing party, like booked. It was like this whole farewell, thoughtful farewell. And then COVID hit. And I was like, God damn it. And then that's it. We closed. And it was like, it just was like, it was just silent and it was okay. I, I mean, I felt bad because I wanted the engineers to have this kind of like a little bit of a fanfare and a celebration, but Oakland is strong. You know, I have a great landlord there and it's, um, it's, it's super stable and Oakland is the kind of the crown jewel. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It exists in its book. Unfortunately, this right before we, uh, we got on this, um, a band that's recording on Monday for four days, they just had a positive COVID test. So, you know, we, there's just, this has fucked everyone and it keeps fucking everyone up. Even if you, yeah. you have the same thing, right? Where you're starting and stopping your business and, yeah. like, and people just cancel and cancel and like, you're up against a pandemic and you're not going to win. Right. And it's, yeah, it just comes to a point where like I'm paying, I was paying rent for something that just wasn't producing any money. <laughs> yeah. yeah any income you know so it's it sucks but like i said you know this came out of it and i just gotta look forward now that's it yep. that's all i can do Absolutely. Uh, i know we're right around the corner from another shutdown here it's you can feel it in the air <laughs> things are starting to close down little by little and whatever i at this point it doesn't alter my life at all <laughs> yeah it really doesn't you know um i mean we get freaking groceries delivered you know it, yep. it's, it's crazy um, but all right, I wanted to get into uh, some favorites of yours, and yeah. then and then we're gonna go over some photos. Cool. Um, so very simple. Uh, who's your favorite movie director? <laughs> I well, I would say that like historically, I mean, there's a lot of directors I like, but one, the one person that really changed my life when I I went to to um, University of Maryland, I got very lucky to get in, and it's a, it's an un it was at the time it was like very non competitive. I think that the anyone with a C minus average or above could get in. I had a, like a D average and my principal in high school, like wrote a letter, basically, you know, like vouching for me and he knew someone on the board of regents, but I was like a, a really like a troubled, distracted kid. Like I, I really did not like um, middle school and high school. It was like a, a juvie hall to me. I was in a like public schools that were really deeply alienating for me. And so I got into to University of Maryland and it was, I remember the first couple of days that I was there, I was like, whoa, they don't take attendance. You know, I was so dumb. Like I didn't know anything about college, you know? Yeah. And I was just like, whoa, they don't take attendance. That means that they don't care if you're here or not. Like it, it was insane to me that it was voluntary. And once I realized it was voluntary, I was like, okay, this, I can work with this because I'm very anti-authoritarian, you know? And like, so, and then I realized that you could take, like pick weird classes, you know? And like, and like, I, 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 I could do core curriculum, but I, but I was like, whoa, I can take a class on Ingmar Bergman. Okay. So I took a class on Bergman and, you know, Bergman and really, I think he's made like 50 or 60 features and like tons of like, you know, t serial TV stuff for Swedish TV and like, so we watch two movies uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. So we, we watch four movies a week. Wow. And it totally changed my life. Like, yeah. I mean, it absolutely, and the professor was phenomenal, it, unbelievable. And like, so that experience of being immersed in like, who, who, who he to me was like the benchmark of like a true fearless artist, very productive, very loyal, and just like an incubator of talent and a great writer yep. and um, like his visual style that he like, you know, he, he started working with Sven Nykvist on uh, Sawdust and Tensel and he like picked, he found his cinematographer and he worked with him forever. Right. You know, it's just like, so that I, I Bergman was huge for me, but honestly I watch fucking everything. Like, I mean, yeah. the, I can't wait for Mank to come out the new Fincher movie. Like I yeah. watch, I watched from super garbage, Queen's Gambit, which I was watched every episode, total junk, very fun. Like, yeah. I, I, fuck, I watch, I'd watch Real Housewives of whatever, Salt Lake City. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not a snob. You know what I mean? But 
but I, I, I watch everything. I really, really like stupid comedies, like horrible. Oh bosses man. Too. Like I will rep for horrible bosses too. Until yeah. the end. like, fuck. I even liked the movie that no one likes, which is, um, what's the, uh, the one with Bradley Cooper, where they go into to Vegas or whatever the, the hangover. The, yeah, the Hangover, but the Hangover Three. Yeah. <laughs> like, like that's so. Like I like I'm so deep into this stupid shit that I'm like I'm like a rep for like the obscure shit, and of course all of the Apatow stuff, all of the Will Ferrell stuff. I'm all in. I'm all we, Sarah, Sarah Marshall, like all in. We are. We have very similar tastes in in, yeah. in things. I'm the same way, man. I watch the most like serious, gut wrenching drama to the yeah. dumbest comedy in the world. And Hangover 3, people are going to, you know, talk shit. But <laughs> Hangover 3 is it, actually my favorite one. It's the best one. It's the best one. It's, it's dark. It's yeah. weird. Yep. It's more in the vein of, like, Todd Phillips style. Who, who 100%. Does. Yeah. Absolutely. So, the cast is phenomenal. Undeniably. Come on. Like, the giraffe. I mean, it's just, it's the best one. I don't care. It's the best one. It's the best one. The first it, one was like, a, you know, frat boy humor. Yes. You know? Yeah. The second one, the second one was just a copy of the first one, yeah. but the third one stood on its own. And if you don't agree with me, yeah, yeah, I know you do, but whoever's yeah. listening, <laughs> um, and yeah, stupid comedies. I mean, I go even dumber, like way dumber than that. Um, trying to think of something recently, like just the dumbest, <laughs> the dumbest movies ever. And my wife's like, "What is wrong with you?" And I'm like, "I yeah, don't know. Listen, I, you I really don't know." It's your brain, man. Like we can't just be yeah. Perfect on high alert all the time you know what right I mean? like, we have ptsd from a fucking pandemic man you know what yeah. i mean like absolutely um so ingmar bergman uh what's your favorite movie for him from him oh well I, there's a thing that he did for swedish tv called scenes from a marriage and there's like two versions there's like mm -hmm. a feature cut and then there's the long version i think that like that long version it's it's one of the most exciting things i've ever seen like a later one that's really interesting is, is a movie called From the Life of the Marionettes. That's really mm -hmm. good. But honestly, even his shit movies, like Hour of the Wolf or like any, just see it all. Watch yeah. all of it. It's all, like some of the early comedies are really amazing. Like Monica, like just watch all of it. Shame, some of the middle movies, mm -hmm. Shame, um, Passion of Anna, unfucking believable So we really? made those two right after Persona, which is also great. I, I just don't think you could. I just think you, you get on Criterion and you just fucking roll. You know? I love Criterion. Yeah. Um, he made the Seventh Seal, right? Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. That's a great, that's a really good one. Uh, yeah, I have a cr Criterion fetish. I like buy movies I've never even heard of. <laughs> He's super smart. <laughs> For $40 you a DVD. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Actually, one of the ones I just bought was House. It's um, unbelievable. I, never, I actually haven't even watched it yet. Dude, it just wait. I'm telling you, it is unbelievable. I can't wait. It's awesome. so fun, and it's so visually creative. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to see that one. I'm a huge horror fan, so I was like, oh, this is, like, perfect. It's great. It's weird. It's horror. I'm going to check it out. So, um, favorite rap album? <laughs> if you can. I'll, if you can. I'll give you this. So, the, um, of, for last year, there were two. And the two, my two favorites were one, Billy Woods, Hiding Places, and then two, Slouch and Malone, uh, Crater Speak. Um, and then this year, I would say that like a huge record for me this year was the J Electronica record. Of okay. Testimony. Um, <laughs> fucking believable. So good. Um, but I listened to so much rap, like mm -hmm. hours and hours a day. So if you ever, if anyone's interested, if you're interested, I have every year I do huge rap playlists on Spotify. Oh, on my nice. artist account. So I have like an indie playlist and then I have a rap playlist. And like on the indie side, there'll be like also the electronica stuff sprinkled mm -hmm. in that I like and stuff like Charlie XCX. And then on the, the rap stuff, it's like, it, it goes from like rap Ferreira to like some fucking just like young nudie, some just like some like really like trappy shit and some and some 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 dirty <laughs> fucking noisy weird stuff and like i love that I just rap to me is the most it's the you know it's like 
60 plus percent of all streams, right? So mm -hmm. rap is where all the fucking people are. It's just, right. there's simply more competition. It's like indie rock has got to be like 5% now. Do you know what I mean? So wow. it's kind of like a numbers game, you know? It's like, and, and like, like indie rock, the, the genre, the name like rap doesn't mean anything. Do you know what I mean? Like it simply has no signifiers. Trap maybe feels like a little, it feels a little bit more claustrophobic for me. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly like phenomenally interesting trap people, but like rap as a umbrella is fucking meaningless. It could be death grips and it could be open mic eagle. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it just right. doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It could be Gucci Mane. It could be, you know, it's like it, it just simply holds like, like so much, you know, it yeah. could be yellow wolf. It could be like, again like it could be uh earl you know it just it doesn't it doesn't mean anything and like yeah. that's its strength i mean could you imagine trying to like start a bluegrass band and then having all these fucking bluegrass people show up to your gig and just like kind of like stare you know what i mean <laughs> that is it it's like a funeral pr procession when you have concrete rules in place and something has like entered into like academia it's fucking over you yeah. need you need the wild west you know genre wise and like Absolutely. and electronica does that too like no one knows what what they're supposed to be doing you know what right. i mean right yeah that definitely they um there's the commercial stuff you know as far as rap goes yeah um i don't say I, i'm not gonna say i hate it because some of it i do like but yeah man there's so much good stuff out there just people don't even know it exists there's it's there's so much underground stuff. yeah yeah, I try to find it, you know, within every genre, because I listen to everything, yeah. like yeah. literally everything. Um, awesome. And I try to find the best of each. That's awesome. You know, um, even I'll even go to like death, black metal, you know what I mean? Oh, but, I'll, but I'll find the good one. <laughs> there's a lot, there's some stuff going. You know what's amazing? There's a website called ratemymusic.com and it looks like the internet on like, like 2001. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but no. Go there because it's like it's just a janky user kind of review site but you're gonna see how fucking top level this shit is i mean wow. it's amazing like number the number one record right now is microphones in 2020 which is a band camp only release which is great and then there's like the number two now is clipping clipping's new record's very good okay um and then you'll just see like there'll be like john hopkins then there'll be some crazy fucking death metal that i've never heard of that's like yeah deeper and darker than shit that I'm like willing to like explore right now in my little office. You know what I mean? But like, yeah. but like it is a fascinating, um, like, 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 like incredibly useful, um, resource. It's, Absolutely. It, it's really, the website is refreshingly ugly. It's called ratemymusic.com. Ratemymusic.com. I got to yeah, check that out. Um, where can we hear your playlist too? Is it under, it's just under your name on Spotify? It's on Spotify. You, so Spotify kind of fu is like very poorly, like, like the UI is very poor. So yeah. there's my artist page, my art. So if you look under John Vanderslice, I think you'll find a user account. Ignore okay. that because they make you have a user account. Go to my, my artist page okay. and then it has public playlists. And then I'll have like rap 2020, rap 2019 2017 2018 all that stuff indie rock all the way down and then i have a mode selector curated playlist i have a dance music playlist which is all like electronica in-house stuff um i have a juju and um high life playlist so i just i just try to like you know these are love letters to stuff that i listen to and i do the yearly playlist because they kind of keep me honest like you sure. know i i think that we should all be listening to stuff coming out this week like i think it's incredibly important to be current uh, absolutely you know, keep it alive it's really important yeah absolutely and i love i love that's why i ask these questions too because I, like you'll mention a few things that i never heard of i'll go listen to it and boom i now have something i now love yeah and i could pass that on to somebody else and you know so on and so forth but um it's important yeah to not only uh listen to other people what they listen to but to keep current with things and keep the uh industry alive you know yeah. um favorite documentary <laughs> that's a very good question well I, I will say that i just saw the um the new errol morris um documentary about um about uh wait let me look it up because yeah, it's, yeah. 
It's really fucking good. Um, Will, is Wilderness of Errors. It's called Wilderness of Errors. And it's about this, um, what's been called like the most complicated murder case in, in the U.S. And um, it, it, it involved this, I think he was a military doctor in, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And he claims that someone entered his house, attacked him and killed his pregnant wife and his two kids. Uh, and it's fascinating because it feels very obvious, like he staged it. Mm -hmm. And then Errol Morris, who I really respect and who I think is like deeply cynical and rigorous, he comes out in the middle of the documentary and basically says, I don't think that he did it. <laughs> and, and then he starts presenting counter evidence and it's like, fucking Christ. Wow. It is so interesting. So I, wow. I would really recommend that. But I like, I like docs. I mean, I, there's stuff that I just, it's just like, sometimes it's too much reality for me, mm -hmm. but I tend to watch, I don't know. I watched the staircase, which I think was great. I like kind of like, I like, I like documentaries that like, um, that, that kind of like unravel this really crazy true crime shit where the, 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 the case is like, is as complicated as humans are. Mm -hmm. and, and where you get this like window into um, like, like how, I don't know, like, like nuanced, even someone who murders someone else is. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's never <laughs> fucking clear, you know, and it's never, it's never like, uh, it's never not complicated. Right. Very cool. Yeah, I, that's another question I love to ask. Um, I get so many cool documentaries, you know, like I'm with, I'm with you though. I don't want to watch something that's too, you know, like it's like watching the news or yes. something just depressing, yep. but there are so many, there's some good ones that are just like, wow. <laughs> um, so, all right. What I'm going to do next is bring up some pictures. I'm going to share my screen. Cool. Cool. Uh, I pulled some pictures um, because of the day I had with running around trying to get my router and everything. I'm not gonna lie to you. I did this kind of last minute. Oh, all good, all good. I can talk but, about it. But, <laughs> but I think I got some good ones. So hopefully, uh, you should see my screen now, right? Yep. See okay. it. Great. Uh, this is the first one I bring up. This is the one I made the little, um, you know, promo for. Yeah. Uh, so do you remember what's going on? Where you are here? Yeah. That's in at Bowery Ballroom in in New York. And that's, I still own that microphone. That's a Bayer TGX 60. I don't own that guitar. That was a, a 1969 um, a Gibson uh, 335. Um, and I lost that. I remember losing that shirt on tour. I remember um, a guy who did artwork for me on my second record, Time Travel is Lonely, made that shirt. And I loved it so much. I lost it on tour. I remember those pants. Uh, I don't know where they went. And I <laughs> really never have my hair that long anymore. So it's kind of like wild to see that. And I assume if I'm looking left, then I'm, I'm looking over at um, Ian Bjornstadt, who was my keyboardist at the time. And he was probably doing something like wildly creative and, and amazing. Right, right. It's a great picture. Like I tend, you know, when I make these little promos, I like to grab like, a nice picture. Uh, sometimes people send them to me or sometimes I go pick them out, but this looks like, like an album cover picture to me, you know? I, I love it. That's great. Very cool. Um, so let's, let's get into this. Uh, see what we got here. Oh, okay. So we would discuss this a little bit before. Um, yeah. I'm going to describe it a little bit just for the listeners. Um, what we have here is John's shopping cart. He's looks like he's leaving Whole Foods. Yeah. Uh, and he figured, uh, text on the picture says, I figured out a killer way to steal from Whole Foods. DM me for details. And that I, over the next like week or so, I saw a lot of people uh, reacting to it. You, <laughs> yeah. So what, uh, what do you got going on? <laughs> I'm so, very interested. So basically I figured out this thing that like, so first off, I'm like very transparent on social media and on, especially on Instagram stories. That's kind of like where a lot of, uh, a lot of like my direct communication happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I slowly figured out this thing as I, you know, I, I, 
I like, you know, I went through like a, the beginning of the pandemic, I was like really fucking paranoid about like, sur- you know, surviving sure. me, like, um, and so I kind of like slowly figured out that w- if you're in, first off, like the, the Whole Foods in LA, they just route you to these fucking self-checkout things, which are, you know, we know that Bezos doesn't let people unionize. We know he's like a, a completely toxic, um, you know, like, like, post-capitalist nightmare. I mean, it's just like a fucking joke. This is like, like, no one should have this kind of concentration of wealth. This is just like, it's so poisonous. But so I figured out this way, when I was thinking about like, the lines were so long, they're routing you to self-checkout. And I was like, fuck, this is the dream. It's just to train everyone to be their own dumb checkout person. And you literally have to like punch in like what kind of lettuce it is. And so my first thing was like, okay, I'm going to get like, I'm going to get like the fucking chanterelle mushrooms and then I'm going to just put in white button mushrooms. Yes. That was the first thing. And then the second thing was realizing that it was so chaotic that like, I can just like run things over the scanner backwards. So what I would do is I would like, I would palm something like, like, like an orange juice or something or like oat milk. I would palm it, cover the UPC symbol because there's like two scanners, right? Facing you and then one pointing up. Um, and then I would run the uh let's say it's a tangerine juice i'd run it over the scanner but i'm palming the upc so it doesn't beep but it doesn't matter because it's too loud no one cares um and like it's you're basically operating with impunity anyways because like what are they going to do take you to some fucking office when you're i mean a 53 year old man like right. you know what i mean like arrest me i don't care do you know what i mean like, <laughs> like i'll just put it on my instagram story like i really don't <laughs> fucking care you know and like so i just started getting like a little bit bolder bolder and i got really good at it there's a couple other tricks that have to do with like like you can um there's definitely like 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 there's like ways of you know you can like stack groceries in one area like you're about to like run them over the scanner and then the helper that's there will go help someone else. And then I just immediately just put them in a bag. Just, I don't even want to do the theater anymore because it's faster. So right. this cart, this is like one, two, three, four, it's six bags. Right. And yep. you know, there's like some fucking, you know, $20 block of red John Parmesan cheese. There's some fancy shit in there and it's 56 bucks. So, you know, <laughs> it probably should have been 250 bucks. So yeah. I typed up a very long two page, <laughs> kind of like prospectus on how to steal from and i and i dm'd it to anyone who wrote me so i probably sent it to 70 people that's awesome man you know i i've done these things similar things um and to the point where my wife was like you're going to the fucking grocery store by yourself mm-hmm. i'm not going with you anymore <laughs> good um i would take like yeah, I, oh, these pomegranates are now bananas you know and fucking a dollar 99 you know um or I would just take shit and throw it. Like, cause yeah. when you put it on the conveyor belt, if you skip the scanner and put it on the conveyor belt, it comes back. Interesting. So what I would do is I would just take the bet, like whatever it was and just throw it down to the end of the thing way beyond the belt. So the belt doesn't even know it's there. That's, that's great. It's ballsy though, because if someone sees you throwing shit. Yeah, yeah but, you, but you know- the, the I hidden, never got caught, so. Yeah, but the, you know, the hidden secret here is that they, most states have like a minimum amount of like fraud that has to happen before the cops will even show up. And we're not going to hit that line. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what it is in New York state, but like in California, I mean, I'd have to be fucking brandishing a gun to get the cops there. It's never going to happen. They don't care. I've seen some, yeah. Oh, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I've seen some signs in stores, like right in the checkout, like, we will not prosecute for any item uh, under twenty dollars. Well, so I'm like, yeah. oh great, so I can steal this thing that's eighteen dollars, yeah. and you can't really do shit about it. So thank yeah. you for letting me know. And it's it's way higher. Than that. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. All right, so um, here we have a picture of, I believe this is a tiny telephone, right? Yeah, that's tiny telephone, Oakland. The guy on the left is Rob Shelton. He's the co-producer. Oh, perfect. <laughs> with Jamie. And not me. So they produced the record themselves. They co-wrote all, ever, all the material with me. So they're co-writers on everything. And they've worked with me on the Cedars, on uh, 
on Dollar Hits and then on the new one, which will be released under the name Orange Purple Beach. And they also were in the band for the, the, uh, the Diamond Dog session. So they've been with me forever. They're fucking geniuses and I will like work with them as long as I could possibly work with them. Very cool. So this is, is this recent? This is, um, yeah, that was like last week when we were finishing. Oh, nice. Nice. All right. Uh, I just, I love this picture. You have a great smile going on here and la laughter going on. And who's this on the right? That's, that's Ryan. He's like one of my best friends. He's, he lives in West Sonoma on a 400 acre parcel and he is a total fucking genius and an amazing guy. And I just went camping with him in Sonoma and we just had the best, best time. Nice. He's amazing. Nice. So, um, is he working on the new record with you or at all or no? No, he's just, he's just, he's a, he's a great musician. He's just like, he's really like becoming a contractor in West Sonoma. He lives in like very rural West Sonoma. He used to live in LA. He's definitely like, he's, kind of done with like living in a big city. He has a beautiful dog. He has, he's in like an amazing relationship. He is living on one of the most beautiful parcels of land I've ever seen. I don't think I could pay, there's no amount of money I could pay him to, to, uh, to like leave that place. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. All right, so we were talking about hair before. So now this yeah. is, um, John's getting his hair dyed. Uh, I'm a little colorblind, but is that, is that orange? Yeah, it's it's it's, okay. like, <laughs> it's peach. Like this is what Letitia called it. She said it's peach with like flaming red tips. Nice. So it's like like flaming Cheeto style. And like and Letitia's does my hair. I'm obsessed with her. She's like a genius. She I don't tell her what to do. Like she did yeah. this to my hair. Like she she'll just say, "What do you think about a bowl cut?" And like blue and green i'm like sure i never say no i don't try to game the system i don't guide her i don't say what i like what i don't like i just let her do whatever she's inspired to do right right um so how long ago was this that was like a, maybe two months ago because I, okay. I get my haircut every six weeks gotcha so you change the color like constantly yeah, or weeks it's, it's always different nice all right um okay yeah, here we got John in a, <laughs> I guess basketball get up, right? Yeah, it's, it's, like a basketball. Seven, it's like a 70s ADA, you know, with like Chucks, you know, and yeah. high tops. And like, um, uh, and that's my friend Alex Lilly's leg uh, sticking out. And I, I've, uh, I'm at my, like really some of my closest friends uh, Halloween party. I am Excellent. a basketball obsessive. Like all I want to really? do basketball my entire life and I love basketball and and so it's like the only things I ever wanted to be on Halloween were a cat because I love cats or a basketball player that's it so have you ever played like yeah I played just like pick I was on the JV team and then I know oh, wow. I was not good enough to actually be on the court and then I got dropped from that after one year and then I just played like stoner ball after school but wow. I, I was I was like not very good, but I was totally serious about the game and totally scrappy. And I tr really, really cared. Yeah. This, um, this actually just reminded me of something. So how do you know Chris Mansfield? Oh, Chris, oh, Chris, like, okay. So I was like, I was walking in LA with my ex-girlfriend on Sunset, Meg Webb. We were walking by a bar and then I think this was just really like the week that I moved to LA and we were walking by this bar and Chris was sitting out front with his girlfriend and he said, Hey man, are you John Vanderslice? <laughs> I don't get recognized that often. I'm, I'm small, you know? And like, and honestly, there was something about being with my ex-girlfriend who I really adore and I wanted, always want to impress and being recognized with her. I was like, fuck yeah. Like, this is sick, man. And yeah. Like, <laughs> he just looks cool as fuck. And so we stopped and he talked and he's like, Hey, I used to, you know, I like your music. I used to, to, um, I used to live in Seattle and I know a bunch of people in common. So, so we changed, exchanged numbers and I'm like an unusual person because I'm not a flake. You know, I don't like get someone's number and then just like ghost them or whatever. So yeah. I texted him and I was like, Hey man, let's, let's hang out. 
So like then we like actually hung out. We went and got drinks and then I hung out with his, him and his girlfriend again and like hung out with a couple times he moved, but like we still were in touch all the time. Yeah. And he's awesome, dude. Yeah, oh, he's amazing, man. I mean, I pretty much talk to him like every day. We just text like stupid <laughs> shit back and forth. Sick. That's so and sick. I'm actually I'm like a fan turned friend because yes. we like 15 years ago I did this little magazine and uh he just this was before he even released his like self-titled debut and i don't know i stumbled on him on myspace and yeah long time ago and i did my first interview with him and then when i started doing this again i got back in touch with him like on instagram and that's you know how all this started and like literally we talk every day (laughs) Um, but this picture reminded me because so he sent he had a picture where he was like holding up a mountain with with his finger yeah. I mean, obviously he wasn't, but it looked like that from the perspective. Yeah. And I just, I make stupid shit, like stupid art. So I took um, a basketball and I put it on, like he was spinning the basketball. That's awesome. I put it in the picture and he wrote to me, he's like, dude, I've never touched a basketball before. That's awesome. <laughs> oh like, my God. I'm, he's like, maybe at a party or something, but he's like, I've never touched the basketball before. And I was like, wow, that's insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the cover for your new EP. So is it EEP or is it E? I, I, I just say like EEP, you know, like it's Eep. like a car, it's a cartoon sound that you make when you're in trouble, you know? Yeah, yeah. And like, and then it's came, it came from, it's the sound that you make and I make in kind of like May when you realize that the pandemic is fucking real. That this Mm. isn't some shit that fucking floats in and out of the U.S. and the world. And that, like, we're here for a year and a half, two years. That moment of just, like, eep, fuck. And I like like the look of, like, semi-shock and stunned emotion on my cat's face. That's Clover, (laughs) who I fucking love. And, like, like, so it really, like, meant something. You know, so I made that, again, to ward off depression and kind of, like, bad thoughts. I made an EP right. in the middle of, like, the worst part of the pandemic because, like, what else am I going to fucking do? You know what I mean? Like, sure. I love this fucking EP, by the way. I've been listening to it a lot. Uh, thank um, you. I really am happy with it. And I, as a graphic artist, I love this cover. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just, and I, you know, I drew the... I know. The and it's, like... I know it's simplistic, but that, that's the best shit to me. Like, I that's love, great. I just love it. So this is your cat? That's my cat, Clover. I have two cats. The other one's down here, but I think I can't. She's like, Mima. Yeah, I have two, like, sister cats. And I, I just, they are just, like, love of my lives. Not okay. love. I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to convince my wife to get a cat. We, we had a dog for, um, well, for me, at least 13 years. Uh, but she had him for 15 years. When we met, she had the dog already. Um, and we just had to put them down like a few months ago. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, thank you. So, um, it's been tough. It's been rough. And, uh, you know, a dog's a lot of responsibility. A cat, you know, yeah, cats, you know, you want to give them attention to things, but they're a little more (laughs) self-sufficient. So I'm trying, I'm trying to talk her into it, but she's not really a cat person, but I'm getting there. I'm getting closer. (laughs) Just tell her that I said that like literally like every single non-cat person who gets a cat becomes a cat person. They're, they're ah, not, it's great. a totally different, <laughs> like recalibrate what, yeah. because an animal is an animal. Animals are lovely. You know what I mean? Like right. dogs, cats, it's all good. Like a fucking possum is probably incredible, you know? Like, like, so I think that like, maybe just bring her to the SPCA once and mm. just look at some like strays and just like, just say, we're not going to get anything today. We're just going to look at creatures. Today. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. And, um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start being a little more subliminal. I'm going to like play this record every morning. Like when I play Apple music on my TV, like the cover comes up. That's good. So I'm yeah. going to just start like Cover's seeping people. it in. Yep. I'm going to have to cut this out. So she doesn't know all this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, um, this is more a recent one you have up, and if you, I figured I'd give you the, you know, time to talk about some stuff that's coming out, which I'm really excited about as well. Yeah. So the I, I'm going to put out the next couple records are going to be under a different name. It, it'll be Orange Purple Beach, and and I huh. may or may not continue putting out um, stuff in that name. I'm I'm, I'm re- I just don't know, but it feels 
uh, inspiring and fun to me. So yeah. the Orange Purple Beach LP is done. So that's getting mastered this week by Bob Weston. So that will be kind of turned in um, probably, you know, by the, like the end of the holiday, um, Thanksgiving. And then there's an, an EP that I'm putting out that wasn't done with Rob and Jamie, but that's, it's all like electronic stuff that I've done in, in the back room of my house here in LA. It's like a two car garage. Um, and that's gonna be really abstract and have very little singing on it. Um, and I'm reissuing right now, um, Cellar Door from 2005. Um, it's getting a, um, a, 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 sorry, 2004, it's getting a reissue. It's a QRP 180 gram pressing. And that's in production right now. And then Pixel Revolt is also in production. That's a double 45. That's a 2005 record. Those are both coming out um, on Barsook. And Bernie Grunman remastered those records from the original half inch tapes. So I think that it'll be like, re they'll be very, very good sounding pressings. Awesome. Um, and there's also a rarities record that's just basically like some real oddball stuff that I've done over the past 20 years, like a song with Spoon and like a song with Madeline Kenny and, and a cover of Jason Molina's song and stuff, some stuff that's just never come out before. Um, and that's, that's it done and will be out sometime next year. And then there's also something I forgot on there. The last um, MK Ultra record, Dream Is Over, that's also an, another, that's a, 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 a 500 series 180 gram repressing at QRP. So that will be reissued too. Wow. So, you awesome. know, it's just like, what else are we going to do in the pandemic, but do this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, besides making new music too, and um, yes. putting out the, the old stuff and making it even cooler, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. I love reissues. Uh, so if people don't have like record stores, they can go to, can people get them on Amazon and things like that? Yeah. I think that it'll be done through probably the best way to, I would imagine the best way to do it because I kind of, I think I'm somewhat lazy about all this stuff. Like I, <laughs> I, I really, I don't like really being on labels anymore. I kind of mm -hmm. don't care. I mean, I think that part of it is that honestly that everything's up on streaming. So you just kind of don't worry about anything anymore. You know, right. Like I know that stuff's available. So, but the best way to do to probably get anything is to follow me on Instagram. Cause then I post links. The most, the, the two bar suit reissues, pixel revolt and cellar door will be sold probably only on their site, Okay. but everything else I do is sold on my booking agent site undertow. They do all of the house shows that I do and they have like a really nice merch set up and I love running stuff through them. because I just want them to make money. Um, awesome. So, and then I sell, you know, I try to honestly sell like 80% of these records on tour because it's really a huge part of why I tour. I'm just like a roving kind of store. Sure. You know? And so that, that feels like, that feels like really fun to me to bring out all these new albums, you know, to have. Absolutely. And, uh, and yeah, so probably the, I kind of run everything through Instagram, honestly. Okay. It's probably yeah. the best. And I'm just John Vanderslice on Instagram. Very cool. Very exciting. Um, John, thank you so much. You're the best, Mike. This was incredible. And Amazing. You were incredible. This was awesome, man. I'm, I'm an amateur, okay? This is... No, no, no. It's, it doesn't work. Like, sometimes, first off, sometimes professionals are the worst people in the universe. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing yeah. good about being like, 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 have a system in place. It doesn't mean anything. So you care and you're, you're intuitively connected to what you're doing. And that's all that matters. Well, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. I really yeah. do. You were great. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, let's keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. I'll see you soon. Of course you got, it. I'll see you soon. John, thank you so much. This was thank great. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day. Bye. You too, John. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.